Appreciate your patience. Sometimes these things take patience to get them right. And I've done everything I can to do that for you guys, especially the situation you're in where you're wanting to pass it on. Um, and the sentimental value of it, it's not, it's not just the collector's value, which I'll get into in a minute, but it's, it's the connection with your dad. So um, here it is. We appreciate you doing that. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Very so, beautiful. Let me tell you some of the things that happened. Um, anytime an instrument comes into the shop, we do an evaluation of it. We check to see what the humidity level is because humidity can really play a damaging part to an instrument. So when this guitar came in, I could tell that it had been really dry because we had a crack here very long crack in, in the middle, but the fingerboard had also shrunk from side to side. So we had a crack in the middle and shrinking on each side to the point where it didn't even match the profile of the neck anymore. There was a step there, making it really uncomfortable to play. So originally I tried to save the board, the fingerboard, as it was, and tried to repair that. I would have added uh, wood to either side to bring that out, repaired the crack and all of that. But in the process of taking the frets out, it was so dry and the type of wood that they used, which was not ebony, it just went to pieces. The fret, the fret um, slots disintegrated. So at that point, we decided to go ahead, replace the fingerboard. So this is a brand new piece of ebony. This is an upgrade for this guitar. However, the mother of pearl dots are the originals. Oh, nice. So I tried to save as much of the original as possible. This end of the fingerboard here is thicker than normal because it hangs free. Mm -hmm. It's an extension. So I couldn't find a piece of ebony that was that thick and that, that we, we actually had it slotted. And it came as a, as a rectangular board. So I took a second piece of ebony and thinned it down to 50 thousandths of an inch and attached that to the bottom of the fingerboard so that we had the support we needed here. A lot of guitars have a truss rod in the neck so that it can counterbalance the tension of the strings. We have about a 190, 180, 190 pounds of tension on this neck and the top and the tailpiece. And so to counteract that tension, they put a truss rod in. But this guitar, partly because of its age, has no truss rod. So in, in putting the fingerboard on and preparing the neck and everything, I, I made an allowance for the tension that, was, that would be pulling this direction. Another thing that needed to be done was just some cracks that had happened in here because of dryness again. So I glued those. And, and got uh, a solid a structural piece again. But inside of this, underneath this plate, is, is what's um, described as a, as a tone well. This disc on the top has, a thick, has sides on it about that thick, and then there's another plate underneath that, and then under that is a structure that looks like a cone. And that cone sits underneath here, and as the instrument is played, the top vibrates. And that tone well there takes that and amplifies that sound. And then the cone channels the sound up to these sound holes. So that the structure that's underneath this plate was also coming apart just from dryness. So I, I put that all back together with the original type of glue. It's not. It's not the kind of glue that's, that's used today necessarily. Um, some high-end instrument makers would use it. It gets very crystalline when it dries. It transfers sound really well. 
And, and but that was the original glue? That was, that's the, that's the original type of glue. It's the same type of glue that Stradivarius would have used. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I, that's the type of glue that I use to repair everything that's underneath here. In the process of putting the new fingerboard on, I had to put the new binding on, everything had, I measured everything in thousandths of an inch in order to get it all to come together with the, net, with the existing shape of the neck. This binding originally was white, so I mixed five different colors together into a lacquer and used an airbrush and sprayed that onto the binding to make it match the side, the original side binding. Amazing. No wonder it took a while. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't done overnight, was it? No. The original nut, which is what the strings pass over here, the spacing was odd. What we really try to do is get the spacing to be even between all of the strings. So I made a brand new bone nut, but I have the original and that will be given to you also. But now the, the string spacing is proper. It makes it a lot easier for the player. And originally, um, one of the things that was in the, in the work order was you wanted to restore its playability. So I paid attention to all those kind of things. Lubricated the tuning machines, the original tuning machines on the back, cleaned them up as best I could. I polished the finish, cleaned and polished the finish, but I didn't do anything to like, I could have, I could have repaired some of the missing finish here, uh -huh. but when you do that with a vintage instrument, you can actually affect the value of it. So I've kept it as original as possible, except where we had to do something like the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. So do you have any, any questions about all of that? Oh, I'm just in awe of all that you have been through to produce this beautiful instrument. It was anything but when I handed it over. Actually, I, I'm amazed at the condition that it's in for its age. I think the finish is in really great condition. You can see a little bit of of a footprint from the bridge oh, yeah. where the bridge has been in different positions mm -hmm. over time. And this bridge is really interesting because if you look at it, you can see that it has an arch to it on top. Oh, yes. that, that's to match the radius of the fingerboard. Oh. But it's made so you can flip it over and on this side, if you ran the strings on this side, it would be completely flat. And the reason for that is this guitar was also made to be played with a slide. Even in 1934, they used those. Absolutely. Let me, let me grab this other guitar. I want to show you what Kay was competing with. So this guitar was built in 1934, and it was, it was only built for one year. It was a very limited run. And because of that, it's extremely rare and valuable, valuable. But what they were competing against was this style of guitar. This is a resonator guitar. And the, the idea behind the construction here was it, was, it was before electric guitar amps were invented. So they were looking for a way to make a guitar that was extremely loud. And what you have here is really a speaker cone. And there's the bridge that the strings go over. And that bridge, as it vibrates, vibrates the speaker cone. And this acts like the amplifier. And it's very loud. This is Kay's innovation to compete with this, but it's all wood. And because it's all wood, it has a very, very different sound. It's also not as loud. And I think that's probably why it only ran for a limited time, because if volume was the, the main goal, then this is going to outdo that. But I think the sound of this is extremely unique and special. And here again, that's one of the reasons that it's rare and it's valuable. Do you have any idea of where it might have been made? The K, the K Guitar Company was in Chicago. It no longer exists. We don't have records, so I can't tell you how many were made. 
but from research, I do know it was only made in 1934. You were asking about what the guitar is made of? Yes, the wood. The top is made out of spruce, and some of it is laminated. It's three-ply. This is. I believe this is probably solid spruce, and it's been carved into this shape. Not pressed, not heated, but carved into that shape. Inside, um, it was really common in those days, especially at an instrument in this price range, to make the necks out of poplar. Um, the finger, original fingerboard was a kind of fruit wood, and um, they would treat it chemically to make it black so that it looked like ebony. But part of what happened during that treatment was it made the wood really brittle and really dried it out. So these frets are T-shaped. They have a, a toothed tang that go down in a 22 thousandths wide slot. And when you pull those out with the teeth on it, it tends to want to chip the fingerboard. Um, so I actually tried driving the frets out sideways, and that was successful much of the time, but it only takes one that's not successful to do, to do a lot of damage. So, so it just became a, a point where it's just time to replace the fingerboard. There's, there's something about resurrecting the dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's basically what you've done. Yes, it is. I wouldn't say it was completely dead, but... <laughs> and we wish we knew a little bit more about it. I, I've played just a little bit, but more chords and uh -huh. nothing fancy. And um, we've, we're pretty sure it came from when my dad was raised on a farm in Knightstown. And when they were selling the farmhouse, my dad went down and brought it back home. And it's been at my house ever since. Okay. So um, protected, hopefully, other than the humidity you said. But I think Barb's got a good story to tell <laughs> that we do know about this guitar. Here's what we know. And my dad didn't tell too many tales. But this one we knew about. In 1934, 35, he would have been... 13, 14 years old, and on one of those two birthdays, his mother gifted him with this beauty. Uh, Hazel was pretty much self-taught, his mother, and she was bound and determined with her two boys that they would be educated, and a part of an education had to be music. And so here it came, and it had a little book in it of songs, and he was pretty well self-taught as well. However, she had one request of him, and that was that he perform a specific song for a specific group of her friends. Well, Knightstown, Indiana is a very, very conservative rural community. And my grandmother, and grandfather belonged to the United Methodist Church in town. The farm, of course, was out a ways. And she belonged to a group there called the WCTU, which stands for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Ah. There was no talk of any smoking or alcohol or curse words when we went to visit our grandparents. We were taught very carefully zip it up when it comes to certain conversations. But here he is, and she said, Lloyd, learn how to play Amazing Grace for my friends at the meeting in the church basement. He practiced and practiced and got it down really well. So he played Amazing Grace. The ladies were in awe, and they clapped and they wanted an encore. <laughs> he didn't know any other songs. He didn't have anything prepared. <laughs> Nothing prepared, but luckily for him, inside the case of this guitar was a songbook, and he picked out the first song he could find that had the same chords as Amazing Grace. 
he didn't for, know the chords. song. He knew. Yeah. But the chords were perfect. He started playing Little Brown Jug. <laughs> now, <laughs> Yeah, little right. brown jug, <laughs> jug to the Women's Christian Temperance, Temperance. Union. <laughs> Needless to say, his mother was totally mortified. The ladies listening to it were going, oh! <laughs> Prohibition. Dad had no idea what a little brown right. jug was. Right. <laughs> Especially his age. No. Well, think so of this. Anyway, this song played Little Brown Jug. Okay. Little Temperance. Can you play Little Brown Jug? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd like to hear Little Brown Jug out of this. <laughs> anyway, that's our, that's our story, story and we're sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we know it stayed with him on the farm until he went off to college, as I said. They were just a farm community. None of them had ever gone to college, but by golly, my dad was gonna go there. And so at age 19, he got the word that his mother had died. Uh, the younger brother was just 11 years old, left back on the farm. Dad wasn't sure where he was going to go, but after she died, he went on to medical school. And of course, World War II came along. So using the money he could get from them after medical school, he went on to specialize in radiology he was going to find breast cancer in other little boys' mothers oh, a lot earlier wow. than he was able, or the doctors were able to find with his mother. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. And so this guitar means the world to us mm -hmm. with that kind of history. Thanks for sharing that, that's, that's a great story. Her son is the oldest of the grandkids of his grandchildren and he does play the guitar but his his daughter is really good. We'll find out just how good, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we're excited to give it to Carrie, and he'll mm. he'll he'll be a good caretaker. So so maybe it's time to give it a play. Oh uh, huh? yeah, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> are, you, are you ready? No uh, pressure or anything. Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> we're excited to hear it. I'm excited to play it. It's not every day you get to play a guitar from 1934. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sounds my beautiful. My mind, dad, is up there listening to this. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you, Atticus. Thank you. I'm just happy to be given the opportunity to play for you. And this is a beautiful guitar. It plays great. So you said uh, you're passing this on to a granddaughter? Eventually to my granddaughter, which would make it a fifth generation. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm sure she'll enjoy playing this. It's, uh, 
it's not only a great playing guitar, but the the family lineage attached to it. It just like just gives this guitar a lot more weight than any other guitar, you know. So it's just not every day you get to play something with uh, the amount of history and it's rare and the family connection on top of that. It's just one in a million. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad we've got Sweetwater here that was able to do this for us. So. Pleasure to do it. Yeah, this guy, he, he knows his stuff. <laughs> I, I got a lot to learn from him. Do you have a clue how many hours it took to get it to this kind of condition? I haven't added it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. All of you. <laughs> a pleasure serving you. Thank mm -hmm. you.